Welcome filmmakers, fans, and friends to Indie Cinema Showcase. I'm your host, John Thiessen, and each episode, my co-host, Tim Anderson, and I will be here to bring you the best and brightest in local independent cinema. Each show will highlight a specific aspect of independent filmmaking, be that an actual genre, the role of certain key crew members, or various outlets or resources for filmmakers to utilize in their productions. We will then discuss the ins and outs of these topics with our industry guests, while also spotlighting some Florida-made films that are great examples of the subject matter. Today's show topic will be focused on the screenwriter and how their words can make or break even the best-run productions. Later in the program, we'll be joined by award-winning writer and producer Barry Sandler to share his insights with us. All right, gang, let's get things rolling with a very intriguing short film about world-famous pilot Amelia Earhart getting lost after flying through a rip in the space-time continuum. The film is entitled Earhart and was produced and directed by recent UCF graduate Ali Kenyon. We hope you enjoy. My name is Amelia Earhart, and I am missing. I mark this entry, July 3rd, 1937, though I fear such trivial matters as date and time may no longer be relevant. As I write this, I find it difficult to describe or even comprehend what's happened to me, but it has always been my firmest affirmation that the most effective way to do something is simply to do it. So I'll begin. I believe that I've become unstuck in time and space. There's simply no other way of putting it. I find myself wandering through lands I know cannot exist, having no memory of how I came to be there. I don't know what's come of my plane or my co-pilot. I pray they're both somewhere closer to home. Now, I suppose partly due to my nature as an explorer and partly to maintain some semblance of sanity, I will be documenting my travels in this journal. I'll mark each new world as one day. What good it will ultimately do me, well, that remains to be seen. July 4th. Today is Independence Day, yet I can honestly say I've never felt less a sense of freedom. Tossed from one place to another, I suddenly find myself in a strange restaurant, surrounded by people eating with frenzical fervor. I come to find out that their gluttony has purpose, albeit a strange one. Here, the standard of beauty was such that the most obese members of society were deemed the most attractive. I am sickened to see an entire culture so focused on attaining an impossible notion of physical beauty that they are willing to sacrifice their health to do so. I have always been weary of those who would seek to control my actions, most of all my own sense of vanity. I fear the place may infect me with its madness, and I'm quite relieved when I leave it. July 5th. After wandering for quite some time, I come across a path and decide to follow it. It leads me to a group of men one of many in this place, committed to perpetually while away their lives at some misbegotten notion of work. Though I can discern no sign of progress in their labors, they toil constantly with concern for nothing else. I begin to ponder their existence, a life in which every ounce of attention, every thought in their heads is devoted entirely to work. These men have no regard for music or art. There is no desire to create or imagine. They are people alive, but not living, merely existing. I am struck with a curious desire to disrupt their repetitive routine. However, I worry as to what ramifications my actions may have, as these types are known to thrive on monotony and show little kindness to instigators of change. July 6th. July 7th. 
This new place seems like some ruin of a once great civilization now fallen largely into disrepair. The population which remains are remarkably lazy, finicky creatures, content to lie around all day in idol worship of some esoteric demigod. Though their religion lacks any logical structure, they nonetheless make numerous offerings to this obscure deity. I am shocked to find out that the focus of all this praise is nothing more than a common house cat. I can no longer sit by as my fate is decided for me. The most difficult thing is the decision to act. The rest is merely tenacity. The fears are paper tigers. You can do anything you decide to do. You can act to change and control your life. And the procedure, the process, is its own reward. Nevertheless, I cannot help but question what chain of events could possibly have led me here and wonder what lies ahead. July 8th, or 9th, or 10th, or 35th, or maybe it's May, or June, or maybe I haven't been born yet, or maybe I'm already dead. This will be my last entry. The act of writing is quickly losing its meaning. Hard to know where I am for more than a few moments. Harder to keep track of where I've been. I don't know if there will be some end to all of this, but the uncertainty of it no longer worries me. It is only by staring, unflinching into the face of chaos that we can truly call ourselves fearless. If anyone finds this, please tell people what I've written here as a warning so much as a reminder that the world is infinitely more complex and beautiful than any of us could ever imagine and that no matter what we should never ever stop searching my name is amelia Earhart, and i'm not afraid Pilot. Of course, darling. Whatever you like. Once again, that was Air Heart, directed by Ali Kenyon. Now, each show we like to give our thoughts from the popcorn gallery and offer our feedback on the films we showcase so we can give you guys something to complain about. Now, John, what'd you think of Air Heart? Well, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, Tim, and say that Air Heart was probably the best film we'd ever showed on Indie Cinema Showcase. Um, I mean, it had so much going for it. it. I mean, I've got nothing bad to say about it. I thought it was obviously very thought-provoking, yep. very well-written. Today's uh, show is about screenwriters. Yep. Uh, extremely well-written. Uh, experimental in many respects. Uh, and a lot of the subject matter she's dealing with, obviously deep social commentary. She's yeah. dealing with meta, the metaphysical realms in regards to parallel universes. All, all these kind of things that I personally really get a kick out of in my own life in, in learning about and such. And she kind of worked all of that in into this very uh, simple, amazing experimental film. I think it's an amazing movie. I think it's fantastic on so many levels. It's technically probably one of the most proficient films we've showcased mm -hmm. yet. It's expertly written. Um, she's gone out, she's using, I don't know if you, if you know, but she's, she's using Super 16. Mm. She's using digital video. She's intermixing all of that together. I mean, it's just a perfect short film. I was 
never happier than when I sat down to finally, you know, watch this movie and sure. it ended. And it ends on such a profound note. And it's not that I didn't see it coming or that I think that it's got this big twist that just happened, but it's just so perfectly wrapped up. Sure. And that's something that film short filmmakers, you know, miss the boat on a lot. It's perfecting that one idea. And what Ali did with this movie is just, and I know that she's not the writer of it, but in, you know, in auteur theory, I mean, she is sure. the author of, of this film. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's a very female centric movie. And you, you touched on it too. I mean, it's got great social commentary, but it isn't hitting you over the head with mm -hmm. it. It's so subtle, all these little quantum leaps. So I, I was like sure. kind of giggling to myself about that, that Earhart takes is, um, addresses a social issue that exists right now, but in an absurdist fashion. Sure. Well, to follow up with Allie and to see what other projects she's working on, visit her website at movingpictureparty.com. When we come back from the break, we'll be talking with screenwriting alumni Barry Sandler. Stick around. Welcome back. Since on ICS, we want to do more than just show fancy moving pictures to our audiences. On this episode's Industry Insights segment, we're very excited to have with us UCF professor and longtime member of the Writers Guild of America, Barry Sandler. Thanks for being here, Barry. Great to be here, John. Thank well, to kick things off, Tim. Barry. Oh, and Tim, too. And Tim, of course. Oh, thank you, Barry. Don't oh, forget you. Tim. No, um, <laughs> all right, Barry, to kick things off, how did you get your start as a screenwriter? As a screenwriter? Well, I. Uh, I took kind of an unconventional path. Uh, I was uh, uh, born and raised upstate New York, Buffalo, and was always uh, a big movie fan as a kid growing up, loved movies, and was very determined uh, from early on to come out to Hollywood and you know break into movies as, as a writer. I always loved writing. I used to write short stories. I you know I would uh, uh, create different weird characters as a kid, and I was just determined to come out. So I went to uh, enrolled in UCLA Film School and uh, uh, with a uh, uh, major in screenwriting. And as an undergraduate, um, I had uh, uh, gone to the roller derby, which was a uh, kind of a the subculture phenomenon yeah, sure. in LA. And I thought it would make a great uh, uh, subject for a movie, never been done before. And I thought I would focus on a, a female roller derby star. The huge star at the time was Raquel Welch. Okay. It was the early 70s, and, right. and uh, uh, she was uh, kind of like this big pop culture diva. So I wrote the script uh, with uh, Raquel Welch in mind, and uh, finished the script, uh, and got one of those maps to the movie star's homes. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, Old school. Found her, uh, her house located on it, which I was- I always wondered you know, if that was really their, lo like their houses, you know, if you just yeah, like- Well, in this case, it was. Yeah, uh, it was uh, uh, right up bed in a canyon, a winding route, and I ended up uh, in front of her house with my script, and I went up to the uh, very, you know, just braced myself, took uh, the script under my arm, went up to the doorbell, rang the doorbell, and uh, uh, her assistant answered the door. And I said, uh, I know this is um, you know, not usual practice, sure. but I'm a you know, UCLA film student, and I've written the script for Raquel Welch. And uh, I think it'd you know, be a great power for her. And, you know, and she was very taken aback by it. Sure. Said, well, and this is you know, not the usual procedure. I said, I realize that. But so she said, Raquel's in Europe, but I'll read it, and if I like it, I'll tell her about it. To make a long story short, a lot of things, you know, a lot of time went by. But ultimately, she ended up reading the script wow. and wanting to do the picture. And that's basically, you know, that was the first big break I got. Wow. Talk about self-promoter. As an that's undergraduate. That's the way you do yeah, it right there. The film ended up uh, being made and made, uh, made a lot of money. So it was, the, it was a good credit to start off wow, with. And the and rest is history. Basically, yeah. And I ended up using that script when I went to uh, graduate school, as my master thesis, so oh, okay. you know, it served several purposes. Usually, when you you know something like that, did you stay attached to the script through development? No, 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 no. In fact, that's a great question because I learned a lot from that. No, uh, the script went through a lot of changes because yeah. it, it went through three different studios. It st we first sold it to Warren Brothers, went into Turnaround, went to United Artists, ended up at MGM. 
in the process, there were a whole series of writers. I mean, originally, you know, I was a kid. I was like, you know, 21, 22 yeah. years old. Just They figured, no, we want to get a seasoned writer to sure. come in. And then that writer didn't, you know, uh, conform to what the studio wanted. So it went through a lot of writers. Uh, the, the final film is not the film that I had originally envisioned. Mm. Um, it took a lot of different uh, turns. And the film ended up being a hit and making money, and I, you know, I, I did well by it, but yeah. it's not the original script. So that, but I did, I, Tim, I'm glad you brought that up, because I, I learned a big lesson about it. It was very painful to yeah. see, you know, because it was my baby, and I just, you know, I was fairly young and innocent and didn't realize the realities of the business, yeah. that, you know, you do have to give up uh, ownership of your material if you, uh, you know, want to see a movie made. Yeah. And it holds true to this day. And after that, I, you know, it was a hard lesson to learn, but I decided um, that, I, was tr I would try to retain as much control over original screenplays that I would subsequently write. Sure. In terms of assignments, it's harder because yeah. you know you're being paid, and that's the trade-off. Mm -hmm. You get paid to write, you know, an adaptation or an assignment yeah, or a pitch. Yeah, they're bringing you in. But if you spend your, you know, your your blood and guts writing your own original material, you want to retain as much control as you can over it, and that's the lesson I learned from that. So, what's the hardest part you found of either making characters seem real or compelling dialogue for them what, to really? What break I through? tell my students, my writing students, mm -hmm. uh, first day of class, I say, you know, from now on. When you're outside, when you're you know in a restaurant, when you're you know just standing in a line or something, listen to the way people talk. Mm. Take a notepad or take a tape recorder or take something. Just listen to how people talk, interact, sure. observe, open your eyes, look at human behavior, look at human uh, the the nuances of how people hold their hands or how people scratch their head or just ticks that reveal character. Sure. Just open your eyes and open your ears and listen. So you, you agree that it's important, I think, for a writer to have a working knowledge of how a film is made oh, absolutely. to write it their does. screenplay. Oh, absolutely. Does. Sure. Yes, it was, I was fortunate uh, early on to be able to work with some terrific directors and be on the sets mm. of, of their films and watching them work. And while I never wanted to direct, you learn a lot about writing. You learn a lot about also being with actors is very yeah. important. Mm -hmm. because Actors, you know, ultimately as a writer, you relinquish ownership of your character to the actor. And when you're working with really good actors, and I've had the great fortune to work sure. with some great actors, um, they will, you know, ultimately be able to convey an emotion without three lines of dialogue, but maybe with a look or a gesture. Sure. And you learn then that you don't need to overwrite, that you don't need to um, uh, a, a really kind of, you know, uh, extend dialogue to the point where you're trying to sell something where you can sure. sell it through a look or a gesture. Sure. Yeah. Good actors will, you know, will, will you learn from that. You learn from good actors. What advice do you have any upcoming screenwriters? Well, I think the the key uh, uh, element is uh, perseverance. I think, you know, to write, to 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 uh, to, to see movies and, and, and live your life and draw upon your own life experience, yeah. but being seeing a lot of movies to be able to put it uh, in the framework. Yeah. Of, of, of a screenplay, but uh, to not be deterred by the fact that you know the first screenplay isn't necessarily going to sell. Sure. Yeah. The second one may not. But and and also the advice I would have is don't go into this business unless you know deep in your heart you're not going to be happy doing anything else because mm. yeah. it's tough and you're going to be dealing you know facing a lot of rejection. But you know it, it's that element of perseverance that's going to get you through, knowing that you know you have enough. Uh, faith in your own talent that, you know, someone ultimately is going to recognize it. I and think. taking from your first story, also being a self-promoter, you yeah. know? Not being scared to go knock on Raquel Welch's... Uh, well, I wouldn't... See, now, I, if you go to that today, you'd probably advice. be arrested. I wouldn't advise doing that today, yeah, because this was pre-stalker era. Sure, yeah, you know? sure. Yeah. Today, you could do it and you end up shot. in, you know, in well, you jail. Well, you end up in jail, and you're on the news, shot. and you still get buzzed. <laughs> exactly. You get some bang right, out of it. Right, This is a more innocent time in the Well, once again, Barry, thanks so much for being on the show. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. We definitely appreciate it. Great. To keep in touch with Barry and his latest projects, you can email him at bsandler at mail.ucf.edu. As Barry heads back to his classroom, we're going to take a look at this episode's feature feature. This feature film comes from director Andrew Kenneth Gay, and it's called Beautiful Belly. Hope you enjoy. Hi, my name is Jason Ackhart. I am a elementary school music teacher here in the Sunshine State, but my real passion is writing and performing for children. I would love nothing more than to become a member of the Happy Kids family of entertainers. So, uh, here's my song. Sometimes your mommy doesn't understand. 
Sometimes a rainy day can ruin your game plan Those days got a way of getting under your skin My friend And when you feel that way Just say I'm gonna dance the blues away As I listen to the music play Come on and dance the blues away As we listen to the music play Just dance the blues away As you listen to the music play You gotta dance the blues away today Now since on ICS we're not here just to listen to ourselves talk, we're going to try to impart some wisdom with our fun facts segment presented by GreenroomOrlando.com. These facts are sent to us from the wild world of the internet. Now, this episode's question is from Donna. Dear ICS, I've been writing short stories for years and I wanted to take a stab at writing a screenplay. I noticed there's a ton of books and programs available to me, but I'm just a bit overwhelmed. Are there any specific resources you can recommend? Want me to take this one, John? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's an industry standard, so why don't you tell them about it, Tim? Well, look, guys, the industry standard for shooting a, or doing a screenplay is, is Final Draft. Now, there's a dozen other approximations of Final Draft that are out there. And they all offer you essentially the same features, but... If you're looking to do this professionally, you might as well drop the extra seventy-five to hundred dollars that you're going to spend buying Final Draft as compared to one of the knockoffs, mm -hmm. and just buy Final Draft. Mm -hmm. um, now, I'm not saying you have to have it to start out with. I mean, you could format a screenplay in Word. Sure. I mean, I well, I think that that's if people don't know though, that's the really the cumbersome thing. I think we probably all wrote our first script on Word or trying to tab it in and and, and yeah, have a screenplay of some. You know, I remember the first script I ever or screenplay was I got train spotting. I bought the train spotting screenplay and tried to match up what they were trying to do. Well, that's exactly what I did. I bought a screenplay and. And, and, and I try to make it look like one. But to try to format that, everything, uh, the cool thing about Final Draft is you can label all your things. So action and all these types of yeah. things. And you, you kind of like register your characters in the yeah, program. It's going to autofill your characters. It's right. going to autofill your scenes. Well, and even though if you're talking about line producers or producers out there, Final Draft can take it to the next step in their respect that you can print out certain scenes and it'll, it'll print out basically the breakdowns of yep. what actors you need. So it's way more than just a simple, I mean, bottom line is it's just a, 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 a a trumped up word program anyway, or yeah. a document uh, program anyway, but with all those little extra nuances, it can really help into your project quite a bit more. If you want to be part of our fun facts segment, you can submit your questions by visiting the ICS link on greenroomorlando.com. If you ask us a question we can't answer, we're going to look it up on the internet for you, just like you could of yourself. Come on. Now, it's time for my favorite segment of the show, Films to See Before You Die. Are you looking for something a bit off the beaten track to check out late at night? Well, each episode, Tim and I pick a couple DVDs that just may have slipped past your radar, but films that we think you absolutely need to feast your eyes on. So, Tim, what film do you need to see before you die this episode? You guys need to see Double Indemnity. Okay? Great film. Screenwriting, this is the pinnacle, people. This is Billy Wilder and Raymond Chandler. Yeah, that Raymond Chandler writing the screenplay for this movie. Six Academy Award nominations, best picture. This thing's like 25 or 26 on the AF I Must See Films yep. list of all time. It's, it's a film noir starring Fred McMurray, yes, Fred McMurray from My Three Sons in a very serious dramatic role. Mm -hmm. Barbara Stanwyck as his femme fatale love interest in Edward G. Robinson, the great Edward G. Robinson. Right. Um, as the insurance salesman boss. Um, just a fantastic mystery suspense thriller about an insurance salesman whose wife may or may not have killed off her husband. The one of the definitive films of film noir and uh, Universal has it out on DVD in a new special edition. Mine is the super ancient one because let me tell you, this was like the third DVD I bought in like 1997. Mm -hmm. um, 
fantastic movie, must see, just, in fact, just go buy it. Well, I kind of did a cop out and just a personal favorite of mine. Um, uh, the tie into writers I'll get to in a second, but um, this is Fear and Loathing in, in Las Vegas. Uh, Terry Gilliam's, uh, I think, just one of Terry's uh, great films or modern great films. Made some crappy ones a, a few in a row. So this is one of the last great ones he made. Uh, Johnny Depp, Benicio Del Toro, in, in some of the most exciting, captivating, you know, weird uh, zany roles that they've yeah. ever played. Um, I will say that uh, this is probably not a movie you want to take a date to. If I, I was wrong when I actually saw this, and I was in early high school and took a girl out, and she had never done drugs and never knew anything about kind of Hunter S. Thompson culture or anything, and she was very upset that I took her to this instead of some ro damn romantic comedy. But um, well, you, you should explain. You know, this is Hunter S. Thompson's story based on the book by right, Hunter it, S. Thompson. and that's where the tie into the writer is. One of my favorite writers, Hunter S. Thompson. Um, I think he's a Hell's Angels. He's written a lot of great books. Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas is one of those. And this is a story basically about him going uh, to Vegas to cover a uh, motorcycle derby or yeah. a uh, bike derby out in the desert, and. If you know about Thompson, Thompson would show up to do journalism and cover an event and uh, kind of coined the thing gonzo journalism. He'd get there and not write about what he yeah, was there it, to write it's about. It's gonzo journalism in that he inserts himself into the event and he's the story. Right, he becomes It doesn't really story. matter what he went there for. He becomes the story. He takes enough drugs to kill a horse and it becomes more of a drug-fueled uh you know, passion uh, ride yeah. for him, as opposed to something specifically about what he's supposed to be writing about. But uh, Hunter S. Thompson is no longer with us. Nope. But um, a, a great film uh, gr by a great director, Terry Gilliam, uh, uh, Brazil, uh, yeah. Fisher King, many other great films. So if you don't know Terry Gilliam, please check out his other works. Absolutely. And this is a great film about a writer. And if you don't know about Hunter S. Thompson, what rock have you been under? He's a great guy. And you should definitely check out his works. Well, that's all, folks. We want to thank all of you out there in TV land for joining us. We also want to thank Barry Sandler for dropping by to share his insights with us, as well as always to our segment sponsors. We hope you learned something new, saw something you loved, or got inspired to get off your couch and go make your own movie. Maybe it'll be good enough to show on the next Indie Cinema Showcase. But until then, we say to all you current and upcoming filmmakers, peace, love, and positive reviews. See you next time.